Good evening and welcome to the AWP 22 Conference and Book Fair in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am Regina Brooks, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. Here is a visual description of myself. I'm African American, brown skin, brown curly hair, wearing an electric blue jumpsuit with pearls. I also want to take this opportunity to give you a friendly reminder that AWP is still requiring all participants to wear masks in public spaces such as this event. We are delighted to bring you this event today. Before we introduce our featured presenters, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our premier conference sponsor, Wilkes University Creative Writing. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. Please join me in thanking, thanking all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. Thank you. Before we start, I do need to do some brief housekeeping. Please silence your cell phones. Remember, there's no flash photography allowed during the presentation. Respect seats marked as reserved for attendees with accessibility needs. Please give the authors about 15 minutes or so after the presentation to get to the book signing table before approaching them to have your book signed. Lastly, we ask that you please be aware of your fellow attendees who may have disabilities and help AWP be more accessible. Specifically, if you see a barrier to accessibility, let us know by calling or texting our accessibility hotline. The number is 215-770-7291. That's 215-770-7291. Please also be aware of those with invisible disabilities and do not question someone's use of an accommodation. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Anya Backlin, who will introduce our presenters. Welcome. It's great to be here. I'm happy to see you all. My name is Anya Backland, and I am the president of Blue Flower Arts. We are a literary speakers agency representing some of the best writers working today, including the three phenomenal women we'll be hearing from tonight. Blue Flower Arts is founded on the deeply held belief that the perfect turn of phrase is a powerful thing, that the beauty of words can awaken us to the power of words and to our own power. We are incredibly proud of our work in fostering moments of connection between authors and audience, whether in person, virtually, or in hybrid events like this one. I wanna thank everyone at AWP especially Cynthia Sherman, Sheila Black, and Colleen Cable. And I also want to thank my all-star team at Blue Flower Arts, Anna, Shannon, Mapes, Miyako, and Rebecca, all of whom work tirelessly to help events like this come together. We all know that AWP is something special, and that's why Blue Flower Arts has been a proud partner of this gathering for many years. Our event this evening will include readings by Elizabeth Acevedo, Dawn Lundy Martin, and Disha Filia, followed by a group conversation. The work of these multi talented artists spans poetry, fiction, essay, memoir, YA lit, criticism, and more. One thing among so many things that I admire about the work of these authors is the depth of love they show for those whom one might think are on the margins of society, but whose experience we know, in part through these poems and these stories, are central to our understanding of this country and this life and this time. 
And so it is my profound honor and privilege to welcome Elizabeth, Dawn, and Disha. Good evening. Oh yeah, we're not gonna pull up being all seco. Like we're here, we're gonna enjoy our time together. I agreed to this event because I saw I was gonna be with Dawn and Disha. I said, yes, I could be at AWP. So good evening. There we go. We haven't been in community in a long time. This is something to celebrate. Um, I'm not gonna chit chat too long. I'm gonna start with some poems and I'm gonna end with some poems. In the middle are also gonna be poems. So it's all poems. <laughs> Ode to the head nod, the slight angling up of the forehead, neck extension, quick jut of the chin, meeting the stranger's eyes, a gilded curtsy to the sun fill in another, in yourself, tithe of respect. In an early version, the copy editor deleted the word head from the title. The copy editor says it's implied, the copy editor means well. The copy editor means she is only fluent in one language of gestures. I do not explain. I feel sad for her, limited understanding of greetings. And maybe this is why my acknowledgments are so long. Did we learn this early to look at white spaces and find the color? Thank God, oh thank God, for you are here. Self-portrait of Eve as Cardi B. Yeah, I ate it, cause fuck it, I was hungry. Ah, <laughs> you still think the snake talked me into it. Please, I lived with Adam. I been you about snakes in the grass. Didn't you know he was always dry snitching on me to pops? Shit, even blame the apple on me like I forced him to take a bite. I, like a hoe, don't be greedy. Why the fuck would I have shared? and I'm a charmer. I asked the snake to find the choicest apple, to rattle his tail like a dinner bell when he did. And damn, that shit was sweet. I didn't even wipe my chin. Why the fuck would an untamed thing like me ever crave a shepherd, ever crave an Eden, when all I ever needed was the wild of this here wool? Goldilocks. So I'm working on a collection, I think, um, and it's a series of myths and um, retellings of fairy tales, uh, as well as this chase after Medusa. So Medusa has the central conceit of how does the speaker learn to be a monster. And so a lot of these poems are dealing with Eve, are dealing with Goldilocks, are dealing with retellings in order to find this kind of way forward um, between the myths we tell about ourselves and the monsters we make of ourselves, yeah? Goldilocks. The woman ponders if this was what she was to learn from the fairy tale, the one of the young blonde who wanders into a house, so fucking entitled, the one who sticks her fingers in the porridges and tongue in all of the spoons. She settles into the chairs and breaks their legs. But this is not enough destruction. She lays on the bed, falls asleep, her outside clothes all over the sheets, got no home training, they never do. <laughs> and this is the moment our woman is confused by, when the bear comes home. She's never read the German original, Maybe it's not the same, but in the story she read as a child, the mama bear finds the blonde on the bed, and instead of claws and teeth and blood and gnaw, instead of knuckles, instead of a wild shriek, the woman offered the blonde a ride home. It was a late night, and really the city isn't safe at that hour. She knows now the exact moment of rupture when she beckoned the other woman into her car and said, I promise it's no trouble at all. I was thinking a lot in the summer of 2020 um, that there were two major events happening um, in, in my sphere of understanding. I love watching takeoffs of 
spaceships into the ether. And so we had Perseverance, young Percy was going up to Mars. And we also had what was um, one of the largest protest summers that we've seen in a very long time. And it was fascinating for someone who is constantly thinking about colonialism to wonder about how these things are happening at the same time. Sending smoke signals to Mars. Standing on top of my townhouse, waving a black flag. Ayo! And I swear on my mother, I hear the corresponding, I. This is the way of islands. I learned in Harlem, I learned in history, the day another black person is executed under the wide open sky with the universe watching a spaceship launch. The canoes, the Taino said, after Columbus returned to Spain. They killed the contingency of Spaniards he left behind after they burned down the settlement he demanded built after the Tainos got in their boats, island to island to island to island, phone tag from Anacaona to Moctezuma. I have no dreams to stake flag into red dirt, have enough dark side right here. And sometimes my itch to discover some shit that ain't my business goosebumps my flesh. I'm not saying it's not in me. I'm saying La Negra is here always. I'm saying La India was here first, paddle shushing in the water. I scream to my cousins in the stars, the devil is now coming for you. Self-portrait as Lilith, who was Adam's first wife. I'm a, I've been married for five years. Um, marriage is very hard some days. And so this was written on one of those days. <laughs> Self-portrait as Lilith. Some days you seem so disappointed, love, but you knew what it was. I am your dread wife. You will not throw me out of Eden. I show myself the door. There is no snake. I plant the tree. I pluck the apple. I bite the pomegranate, the passion fruit, whatever the fuck. I am a feast onto myself. In this wilderness, the feral things name me. And I was raised to one day wash my husband's feet at night. Of course I malted, made myself a woman who unmakes home. You whittled me fine. So why the surprise that I am piercing? Beloved, I could not only writhe when coming. I cannot return to your little garden. And yet you keep joining me in this gnashing jaw of wind. I break through this shell impossible. And you lap at the yoke. And I'm going to read one last little section from my novel, Clap When You Land. Uh, when I first began writing fiction, I was afraid I didn't know how to write a sentence, and so I began writing in verse. And uh, I found that this mix of genres of sustaining a narrative while also being so conscientious of the line is uh, a challenge that I you know, am utterly still enthralled by. And every single time I sit down to write a novel in verse, I'm not quite sure if I know how to do it. And I don't think I could teach someone how to do it because it is such a blend of when you sacrifice the language in order to propel the story and when you have to move away from the story in order to discover something right in the way that the words are, are bumping. And so that kind of instinctual, what am I willing to let go of here? What ego can I release in order to get this done? Um, teaches me a lot about myself. This novel is about a man who had two families, one in the Dominican Republic, one in New York City, and they do not know about each other until he dies in a plane crash. And it is loosely based on the crash from JFK to Santo Domingo in 2001, flight 58587. I am from a playground place. Our oceans that we need for fish are cleared so extranjeros can kite surf. Our land, lush and green, is bought and sold to foreign powers so they can build luxury hotels for others to rest their heads. The bananas and juca and sugarcane 
farmed and harvested, exported, while kids thank God for every little scrap. The developed world wastes gas, raises carbon emission and water levels that threaten to disappear us in a single gulp. Even the women, girls like me, our mothers and tias, our bodies, our branded jungle gyms, men with accents pick us as if from a brochure to climb and slide and swing in him, El Cero, he has a hand in every pocket. If you are not from an island, you cannot understand what it means to be made of water, to learn to curve around the bend, to learn to rise with rain, to learn to quench an outside thirst while all the while you grow shallow until there's not one drop left for you. I know this is what Thea does not say. Sand and soil and sinew and smiles are bartered and who reaps? Who eats? Not us, not me. Even on the day of my father's funeral, Thea doesn't believe girls should wear all black. I was 13 the first time she let me buy a dress of this color. I wanted it for my middle school graduation. It's the same black dress I pull out of the closet to wear to the meeting with the priest. It still fits. I slide on the straps. I pull on black stockings despite the heat outside. Thea doesn't blink when she sees me. She just turns so I can button her white blouse. She wears a white head wrap too. I know the priest will raise a brow, but Thea doesn't care. She is armored in her saints, and they make her brave or reckless. Are those the same? All white like this shows undue devotion to the saints, and our priests don't want to know what's practiced in secret. Thea and I stare at the mirror, the two of us framed in copper, Tears pull in her gaze and I immediately wipe them where they collect in the wrinkles around her eyes. She doesn't flinch at my hand. She curls into my palm. Dia doesn't believe girls should wear black, but if I wasn't a woman before today, I think I am one now. Thank you. Oh, so good. Um, I'm so happy to be here, y'all. I've just been like, in like, living like a hermit in upstate New York. <laughs> I haven't seen this many people in a long time. Um, I'm so happy to be here too with Disha and Liz, this amazing uh, artist who I adore. Um, I'm going to, so I'm working on this memoir. Oh, I can take my mask off. Um, I'm working on this memoir, and I, you know, I'm only really interested in things that I'm working on right now, right? I'm not interested in things that I worked on in the past, but I read this Toni Morrison interview that she did in um, the Paris Review in like 1993, and she said, you should, I shouldn't read from the memoir. So what I'm going to do is... <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read this dedication, and it's kind of like a long dedication, and it's um, my mom is on my mind. Uh, she is 89 years old, and uh, two days ago she, and she's not, she's not very mobile. She has a lot of mobility issues, and uh, two days ago she had a, a fall down the stairs, and, um, but she's okay, but you know. I'm thinking about her a lot while I'm here with y'all. I'm gonna go to hall. I'm gonna go see her next, just in case you're like, "Oh my God, Dawn, go go home." Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So the dedication is is titled um, "From Here Out There." Hartford, Connecticut, where I was born, is like the body my mother currently inhabits a betrayal, a crude physical manifestation of a life lived, a way into the stories that refuse to be told, a holding on and a holding back. The city is situated alongside the Connecticut River, a massive river that stretches from the border at Quebec, Canada to the Long Island Sound. Blocked by intercepting highways and corporate architecture, a person will likely not experience the river from the city or sense its roving beauty, hidden as it is, like a dirty secret. In the Blue Hills neighborhood where my family lived, and my mother still lives, 
you will find tight plots of land with standalone houses built in 1930s, small backyards, some with dogs barking incessantly through the long cold winters, some with side hustle auto repair shops. When I was a kid, we know which houses sold homemade ices, basically frozen Kool-Aid and Dixie cups for a quarter. And later, when I got older, which houses sold dime bags of weed or bootleg liquor after 8 p.m. and on Sundays. We knew that the two white families on either side of our house had the only above ground swimming pools in the neighborhood, maybe the entire city, and that Mr. Strums was a stand up black man who owned his own moving company, and that Mrs. Strums, who often wore an apron, was an old fashioned housewife. We knew which houses had too many people living in them and which thresholds never to cross because of frequent physical violence and general mayhem. We knew which kids had to work the summer tobacco fields at 14 to contribute to the family income. We saw them wet-faced, dirty, and sunken as they returned home in the late afternoon sun. We knew that if we walked too far in any direction, kids who didn't know us would see us as a threat. We knew that this was a neighborhood that other families in the north end of Hartford coveted from their battered slum lord run apartments and housing projects where the elevators smelled of piss and the hallways buzzed with blinking fly soaked fluorescent lights. It is all as alien to me now as the streets and low flung structures are familiar. I carry the house I grew up in like a ghost inside my body. Dead now, my father is a ghost inside the house. He is the non esthete the mad, the flaccid warrior with no words or wings. If a ghost is a cave, I carry the hollow inside me that way, making a space for its echoing call, its indefatigable tether. Whenever I visit the house with the red door, its cracked red shutters hanging precariously from the window frames, I crouch down inside myself a psychic form of protection. The physical distance between where I live now and there isn't what haunts. It's simply, it's not simply that I've moved far away. That's a different American story. Is that, it's that there's no way to come back home from the life I've dreamed up and pried my way into. I will continue to exist out here or out there in a searching place. This American story is one of escape and recapture, of lying with the master like a board in his jolly bed, of loopholes and being special, of labor, opportunity, and tricksters. I write this book for all the secrets, stories. I write this book for all the stories, secrets, and mysteries held inside my mother's body. I write it to purge her body of what it holds and what cripples. I write to kill the ghosts in my body forever dead. It's a disorienting experience to watch a person disappear right in front of your eyes, to witness memory's brittle cage fall apart. Toward remembering, I excavate our family secrets within the wilds of this country, this America, this unyielding fortress in which black people keep trying to survive. In honor of my mother's belief in miracles, I search for all the missing bodies, all the haints we've buried inside ourselves, all the ways we've made ourselves disappear, and of course, all the miracles of emergence and renegade and new ways of being our utterly unique black ass selves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I, feel, I really want my water, so I'm just gonna go get it and come back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just went to Jamaica, and I went to Jamaica for a week um, with a friend um, on a writing retreat. And as soon as I got to Jamaica, um, I was gonna work on this memoir, you know, I got, it's due in September. I was like, oh, everything, there's nothing to do here. I'm gonna write like, I don't know, like 10,000 words this week. As soon as I got there, my computer died. Not like a little bit dead, but like dead, dead. You know, it can't be recovered. Thankfully, everything is backed up. But 
I'm not like, um, I don't write by hand when I write prose. So I was forced into writing poetry. <laughs> so I'm gonna read you a couple of the poems that I wrote in Jamaica on like my phone. <laughs> um, we'll see, we'll see how many I get to. Maybe I'll just read this one. It's called Winter. Winter. No matter what happens, however tragic, or who says what with whatever kindness or malice or whatever is done in the name of some imagined ideal, or whoever is on their knees groveling for mercy, no matter which open palm is raised, a common gesture, and the fury of it all to create a beautiful place, he said, amidst the easy brutality of that, like Fred said, and like I said, it's a reminder not to put lead in my feet as if the nation did not simply yawn into its own mouth, trying to be itself a tango, a sweaty machine, impossible tether. A whale decomposes on the ocean floor. Didn't you know the sea is a giant grave? Where else would they go? My mother cannot tie her shoes flat argument. Does tyranny have its own music trying to find shape. Poem has these little breaks, so I'll just pause as the break happens like, they, like that. At the university, we exhausted a brand of racism and wanted another. Wanted whatever was wound by invisible wire, our eyes blotted by stones. We could be fresh again. Eager bird minds lift up our nasty bird throats, a gully to soak sound, trampling each other with envy. African Americans, they called us to shave the spikes off our rage. I escaped to the long light of island time, a swollen expanse like the breathing sea amongst the grizzled whites. Who could tell how old skin a joyless confetti? Wherever we were, the smother of their large bodies, monstrous shadow, would not shift its weird attachment. You've heard about it. Hands, clamorous forceps, quaffing rum and ale. We're all dying for a sea spray into our nostrils, powder away the bureaucrat endlessly twining toward nothing, the war, the standing with, all of it, the other world, almost fetish catastrophe. I swallowed the seeds too. I left them to, inside me to rot without a thought. Because a way of getting got is split or wedge, reduction to rudimentary tool use or a slow killing, imperceptible eyes restrained, floating in burial dirt, my father adrift weeds toward scythe, a swinging toward recompense, what's held in the bubble between loss and black body as severed wing. It is winter. Gray cement has become my face, gazes into cracked accolades, bottomed out race labor, a merciless hunt behind me, a diving that looks like falling. Into my breath, I breathe my dog's last breath. Whoa. <laughs> Tell him it's okay, like Alice said. Absent weight of him is what I feel. That other world as dim and unjustified as any closet filled with worms. And to howl is the poem's whole, is the whole poem's most corporeal flank when hit a crippling. Thank you so much. Hello, I, um, I'm just honored to be here with Don and with Liz, and I've changed my mind about eight times while I was sitting there thinking about what I wanted to read, just being inspired by them, just line by line. Um, I do want, uh, inspired by what Liz read, I want to read the epigraph to my collection of stories, um, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. It's from um, 
a collection of poems by, called Blue Yodel by a poet named Ansel Elkins. And the poem is Autobiography of Eve. And this is the last verse in that poem. Let it be known, I did not fall from grace. I leapt to freedom. And so what you were saying about rewriting narratives and, and fairy tales, it just struck me. Um, but now I have to pick. I am going to read the end of a story uh, in the collection called How to Make Love to a Physicist. And um, since it's the end, I should probably you know, get you caught up to speed. Um, a middle school arts teacher meets a physicist at a conference, and they really connect. Um, and then they go back to their separate cities, and, and he follows up with her. Uh, but she doesn't respond at first because of her fears and insecurities. And then she does respond, and they have a really great connection again, and then she blocks his number. Uh, again, because of those fears and insecurities. So this is what happens um, after she does that. Oh, I should probably read the, um, the beginning too, just to give you a sense of um, where I started from. How do you make love to a physicist? You do it on pi day. Pi is a constant, also irrational, but the groundwork is laid months in advance. So from there, we work our way towards their um, March 14th meeting or reunion, I guess. How do you make love to a physicist? Forget your home training. Ditch the girdles your mother taught you to wear to harness your belly, your butt, your thighs, your freedom. God forbid something jiggle. God forbid you are soft and unbridled. Sleep naked. This is all your therapist's idea. At first, you're skeptical and resistant, but when she asks you to just humor her because what's the downside? You can't think of one. You take long, hot, soapy showers, catching the water in your mouth until it spills out the corners. You rinse, step out, and rub lavender oil into your still damp scalp, your still damp skin from your scalp to the bottoms of your feet. It's winter, so you bundle up beneath blankets and explore. Use your hands to study the contours and curves of your body, your topography, to study them as fact without judgment. Pleasure yourself, but slowly, to savor and discover every morning and every night. On the weekends, you sleep in, then wake up and cook hearty comfort meals from scratch. No boxes, no cans, no fast food. Crab and kale omelets, roasted red potatoes, seafood linguine, ginger, turmeric, butternut squash soup, caramelized Brussels sprouts, roasted beet salad with goat cheese, coconut curries, beef wellington. You cook and paint and nap and stroke yourself to sleep at night. And as your body begins to feel like a home, your courage grows. It grows bigger than your mother's chastisement in the parking lot after church after service, the first time you go to church, unbound. She asks why you aren't wearing a girdle, why you aren't sucking in the way, you, way she taught you 30 years ago, and how dare you come into the house of the Lord that way. Your mother, who complains of women in the church nowadays committing the sin of visible panty lines, reminds you that she raised you better than this. And you say, I'm tired of holding my breath then you promise you won't come to church that way again. And you keep your word because you won't go to church again at all. How do you make love to a physicist? You send him an apology in the form of one of the many sketches of him you have made in a silver frame. He doesn't respond right away, and you're OK with that. You knew the risk you ran disappearing the way you did. But when he does reach out, you're both quiet on the phone for a long time before you, before you say, it's just something I had to do for me. I didn't have the words for it then, and I'm not entirely sure I do now. I need you to use your words, though, he says. If we're going to do this, I need you to try. 
and I promise I won't ever do anything to make you regret trying. You try to remember the last time a man made you a promise. You decide it doesn't even matter. This man is making you one now. That's what matters. How do you make love to a physicist? On March 13th, the night before he comes to town, you stay up late, taking turns playing old school hip hop and R&B music videos, talking smack about who's going to get served at your dance off, Googling your astrological compatibility, your Virgo to his Aquarius, laughing, giddy. Then Pi Day arrives and you shower while he's en route to the airport. Once he's in the air, his six hour flight, including layover, feels to you like an eternity. His walk from the plane to your car at curbside takes as long as a pilgrimage. You imagine him kissing the western wall of Sabaro, weeping at the Cinnabon, leaving an offering at the feet of Auntie Anne. After he drops his luggage into your trunk and closes it, he turns to you and says, finally. And you say, finally. He draws you into his arm and arms and kisses you. His lips are as soft as you thought they would be. At your place, you make omelets and home fries, which he devours. His appetite is magnificent. Then, even though you're both exhausted and sleep deprived, adrenaline kicks in and you win the dance off by a mile. This man cannot dance to save his life despite talking much shit. <laughs> What's my prize, you ask. Eric pulls you down to the couch and kisses you again. Oh, so we both win, you say. Here's a particip participation trophy. You go in for more kisses and you think, God, let him be forever. You both begin to doze. At some point, you wake up with your head in his lap and your mind in overdrive. You think about your art show t opening tomorrow. You imagine looking at him from across the gallery floor as he looks at your work, introducing him to your girlfriends, your colleagues, your students and your mother. You think that even if today and tomorrow were all there was, that would be okay. But then you hear your therapist's voice asking what you feel, not what you think right now. And you struggle at first to find the words before settling on warm, hopeful, joyous, full. Eric strokes your furrowed brows until your face relaxes. You say, Rumi said, lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. Do you believe that? I don't know, he says, then yawns. Sounds like a mystic's take on fated love and I don't believe in fate. You deflate a little. You want him to be the one you've been waiting for and you want him to feel the inevitability of you as well. You want to be his default, not an option. You want the promises of a new religion. You chide yourself for walking too far ahead, for regressing into 80s song lyrics territory too soon. But then he says, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way recently sparked 75 times brighter over the course of a two hour period and twice as bright as it's ever been in the 20 years astronomers have been monitoring it. By now you're used to him talking science but you're not sure where he's going with this. One theory, he continues, is that the event was caused by a star about 15 times bigger than the sun getting close to the edge of the black hole, disturbing some gases, heating things up, increasing the infrared radiation coming from the edge. But get this, we observed that star getting close to the black hole about a year before we observed the effects on the black hole. That shows just how vast the universe is, how enormous the distance, you say. Exactly, distances, plural, he says. The distance between the star and the edge of the black hole and the distance between the black hole and the earth. So, I say all of this to say that sometimes wheels are set in motion long before the spark is manifest. Is that the same thing as fate? I don't know, but I do know that rare, brilliant events take time. He sighs is why I didn't trip when you didn't respond to my messages at first. I figured if you'd wanted me to leave you alone, you would have said so, but you didn't. Now I did trip a little when you ghosted me, but he shrugs and pulls you closer. I figured you had your reasons. 
How do you make love to a physicist when he unbuttons your blouse and asks, are we gonna be the type of people who sit around talking about roomy and black holes, or are we going to get naked? You answer both. <laughs> you stand up and pull down your skirt and panties. Rumi was an intuitive, Rumi wrote of an intuitive love of God, and he was a Muslim, you say, but people like to strip away the Islam from his work. He runs his hands over your thighs, your breasts, your free stomach. How do you make love to a physicist? With your whole self, quivering, lush, unafraid. Thank you. And I'm gonna read something really short to end. It is the first couple of pages of a story called Peach Cobbler. Um, My mother's peach cobbler was so good, it made God himself cheat on his wife. <laughs> when I was five, I hovered around my mother in the kitchen watching close enough to have memorized all the ingredients and steps by the time I was six, but not too close to make her yell at me for being in the way, and not close enough to see the exact measurements she used. She never wrote the recipe down. Without having to be told, I learned not to ask questions about that cobbler or about God. I learned not to say anything at all about him hunching over our kitchen table every Monday, eating plate after plate of peach cobbler, and then disappearing into the bedroom I shared with my mother. I became a silent student of my mother and her cobbler-making ways, even when I was older and no longer believed that God and Reverend Troy Neely were one and the same, I still longed to perfect the sweetness and textures of my mother's cobbler. My mother, who fed me TV dinners, baked a peach cobbler with fresh peaches every Monday, her day off from the diner where she waited tables. She always said Sunday was her Saturday and Monday was her Sunday but what I knew was that none of her days were for me. And for many of those Mondays off and on during my childhood, God, to my child's mind, would stop by and eat an entire eight by eight pan of cobbler. My mother never ate any of the cobbler herself. She said she didn't like peaches. She would shoo me out of the kitchen before God could offer me any, but I doubted he would have offered, even if I'd sat right down next to him. God was an old fat man, like a black Santa, and I imagined my mother's peach cobbler contributing to his girth. Some Mondays, God would arrive after dinner and leave, as I, and leave as I lay curled up on the couch watching Little House on the Prairie in the living room. Other times, my mother and God would already be in the bedroom when I got home from school. I could hear moaning and pounding like a board hitting a wall as soon as I entered the house. I would shut the door quietly, behind me and tiptoe down the hall to listen outside the bedroom door. Oh God, oh God, oh God, my mother would cry. I could hear God too, his voice low and growly saying yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so we're supposed to switch over to um, conversation. Um, I'm going to uh, ask some questions. Thank Here's like the thing. I'm going to, so this is kind of like, it's two things. There's one is there's a constraint from which the questions are coming. Um, and the constraint is, it goes back to that Toni Morrison interview. I, I just happened to be reading this. <laughs> I was like, like what should we do? Happened to be reading this. It was in the Paris Review in 1993. And I thought I would ask questions based on, mostly on, Toni Morrison's answers. And there might be another straight question in there somewhere, like that's not necessarily directly from Toni Morrison's answers. That's part one. Part two, if you don't like the question, you have to ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Like you want to I like it. I like it. Yeah, you like it. Okay, okay, okay. Let's do it. So, um, I have to look at my notes. Okay, so I'm thinking about the conditions necessary for writing, especially like, you know, these last two years. Um, like a lot of my 
like visual art friends were like in, deep in their studios and they were super productive and I have writer friends who were super productive and like for me I didn't feel like that was like necessarily the case I don't know something was amiss with the conditions that I needed to write um, Toni Morrison famously wrote with a pencil that was one condition she needed a pencil a yellow pad and um, you know because she had kids but then out of habit she also um, like to write when the sun, before the sun rose. That's when she started, around five o'clock in the morning. She says, I was clear-headed, more confident, and generally more intelligent in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we'll just start <laughs> with the easiest question. The conditions necessary for you to be your like most productive, writerly selves. I think one of the hardest things um, the last maybe two and a half years has been realizing that the conditions I was used to before have changed mm -hmm. and that I was going to have to learn what the new ones were. For such a long time, my conditions were very external. Um, I was chasing after something. And that chase, that like it's, it's publication, it's now or never, it's um, you have to strike while the iron is hot, like this kind of uh, pressure I put on myself was really helpful to get me to sit down. I was writing against fear. Hmm. And to be in a place where I felt completely depleted. And so like there was nothing out there that could possibly scare me because I am at, there's nothing left. Um, and then having to relearn how to write out of, um, out of a love for the work out of a recapturing the playfulness of it, out of like, oh, this shit is gonna be dope, and even if it's not, I like it, right? Yes. Like that kind of um, <laughs> very almost childish energy mm -hmm. that I used to write with. It wasn't because anyone was gonna read it, it was just this, um, this is so much fun. Mm -hmm. I'm making things, mm -hmm. right? And I think that I, it, the conditions, I guess, that I, I think of these days, um, feel really prescriptive to me, but they're all facing inward. It's all very much like I have to do um, some deep breathing. So I like do maybe like 10 minutes of just like sitting with my breath. Um, I have to be, I have these like huge headphones that I put on and I'm usually listening to Miles Davis or Ibeyi or Robert Glasper or just like something that is um, really fast movement. And so I'm kind of like writing with the music or writing against the music. Mm -hmm. um, speed is, is a part of it because it gets me out of my head, out of like, this is really stupid. You're not a real writer. Like all that stuff that happens, if I'm moving fast, there's like no time for that part of my brain to catch up. Um, and I need time. Like I used to be like, I gotta get up and I'm gonna do six hours every day. Like I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm like, I get an hour and a half. I feel so accomplished. Right. And so part of it is just like you set your timer for 55 minutes, take a five minute break, you set it for another 55 minutes, and if you did that girl, you go get your nap, you go get your yoga, you done for the day, like you yeah. did good, right? <laughs> yes. And so those are, um, a lot of the conditions have become just way more just me and really small tasks and really small moments of joy and like just celebrating that, you know, the days that I can get to my desk. Yeah. So for me, the pandemic coincided with the release of the book. So that changed everything. So not only the you know, conditions of life living in a pandemic, but also um, you know, I worked on the book itself over the course of maybe five or so years, but really it's been 20 years in coming when I've been wanting to write a book of fiction. I thought it was gonna be a novel. And so, um, you know, there were so many fits and starts, but it was always, that was the goal. And so that's what was driving and shaping it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to finish this book. So then when the book comes out, now what? Mm -hmm. You know, now something else has to be the spark and the catalyst. And similar to what you said, Liz, for me, um, in the pandemic, it was a lot of writers started offering writing workshops on, you know, virtually, because that's something we could still do safely. And so my motivation was just, who's offering, you know, oh, so Rian is offering a satire writing workshop. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna try that. So it became this sense of uh, play and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And then early on from just like a, a practical standpoint, um, I would get up at like 6 a.m. with some other writers and we would co-write. We would get on Zoom and chat a little bit and then just go mute and then just work. Mm -hmm. um, so the combination of 
that's where I was finding community because I was mostly isolated um, otherwise, especially early on. And then this sense of, you know, this is done. So now I don't know, I, I haven't thought about what I'm gonna do next. So let's experiment, let's play, let's, you know, play with form. Um, and, um, and so that kind of shaped it, um, just being isolated and then needing a new sense of purpose. Um, and I didn't know what the next thing was gonna be. Is it gonna be more short stories or is it gonna be another book? But I, start, I just thought, I don't wanna think about it the same way. Mm -hmm. I just wanna be in the moment, which is, I'm interested in satire, I'm gonna try and write a satirical story. And then that, you know, so it was like this kind of laser focus. Yeah. I mean, it was so weird at the beginning of the pandemic because our whole notion of like time change, mm -hmm. remember when it was just like this, What day yeah. is it? Is it yeah. this day again? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and I was, I've been thinking about that lately because so since, you know, I started working on um, When a Person Goes Missing, which mm -hmm. is the title of the memoir, it has a deadline. Mm -hmm. And I have to, one of the things I have to do is like get myself out of the, like thinking about that deadline. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right, I have to trick my brain. What we, when I was teaching at Bard and we were working with freshmen, we would have them do timed writing exercises. Yeah. We use this phrase, the illusion of infinite time. Mm. <laughs> you know, you have seven minutes, but there's no, you know, but there's all the time in the world. <laughs> so it's kind of like I have to trick my brain yeah. into yeah. that. And one of the ways that I do it now, I just started doing this maybe the past like few months, is, um, is. Um, having a study hall day, having study hall days, mm -hmm. where all I'm doing is, um, I say to myself, you're reading and you're writing, but not toward anything, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? But it ends up being toward mm -hmm. the thing, yeah. but there's just something about taking that leisure to just pick things off my shelf that I haven't read in a while, or things that I haven't read at all, mm -hmm. and then taking like, you know, 50 minute writing breaks, mm -hmm. And just seeing what happens, mm -hmm. like engaging in that like illusion of infinite time. Um, when she was asked about, when Toni Morrison was asked about, um, she was asked this question, like whether or not she could write on the bottom of a shoe while riding a train like Robert Frost, <laughs> which I think <laughs> is a crazy question. And then she says, <laughs> and then she says, if it arrives, you know. And you know, uh, if it arrives, you know. If you know it really has come, then you have to put it down. Mm. And I'm thinking just about like that notion of like first something arriving mm -hmm. and also yeah. that kind of like knowing. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that recognition. I wonder if we can talk about like that recognition when a thing has come. Like when you, you know, and it could be like on the micro level, like a phrase or a sentence or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. or it could be like a whole attempt at writing a book. Like when you like came to these innovations in form, say, mm -hmm. in both your short stories, but in mm -hmm. also in like in Poet X, in the Poet X, right? You know, like how did you know that the thing had come? How did you feel the arrival? Or how do you do it? How do you feel it in an ongoing way? I have so much doubt when I'm writing mm. that when something strikes and it's like this feels inevitable and it feels like it's coming from um, almost like a wiser version, like a part of me uh, is mystical enough to trust that. And I think I felt it most when I was a, a, a poet very early on, like it, it would just, uh, it would strike. And I knew like this poem is coming fully complete and I have to get it down. Like there's, I don't know when it was working, but it was working and it has to get on paper. Mm. You know, fiction is a little bit harder I find because when it strikes, it's often like a character quirk or it's a, um, oh, this would be a way to transition through time that I didn't know. But it doesn't feel quite like, oh, here's, you know, 500 words that came out of, you know, wherever it came from, that magic. Mm. But I am finding that that prose just looks a little different when it comes through. You're, you're playing and you're trying some things and then a pattern starts forming and you notice it, right? And it's when you can step away enough from the text to say, oh, there's something I'm doing I didn't know I was doing. Yeah. And so maybe it's not so much that it arrives, it's that I arrive to it enough to like be able to see it, 
like, oh, here's this thing I'm trying. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know I was obsessed with this, or I didn't know I was playing around, um, but I'm, I'm starting to see the pattern of what my voice is trying to do, of what craft-wise I'm working on these days that I, I wasn't intentionally working on. And so I think, um, I mean, it still does feel like magic. I read the, I wrote the whole Poet X and then went back to it and realized that I had been doing this thing where the character was playing with truth, the truth you tell and the truth you don't. And so I didn't plan to have her write two versions of every single assignment. I had planned for the assignment that she wrote was what she turned in. And as I was writing, I'd been a school teacher. I taught eighth grade. I realized no eighth grader would ever turn in such vulnerable work. They wouldn't turn in the first draft. Mm. They would edit it and make it good, like make it what the teacher wanted to hear. And so I wanted to show the seams in the text because I felt like there was something that I learned from, from just a project of, well, here's what I think she would say and this is what she would turn in. But mm. then what does this show a reader? in terms of what this character is afraid of, of saying or of showing. Mm. And then that became this pattern that I, I played with throughout. I realized that I was trying to figure out truth and like what we say and then and what we, we try to hide even from ourselves. Mm. And so that I guess is a rival, but it, it's also like my, I think there are parts of our brains that are doing things um, and it's our job to be aware. Right, like without our consent. I, you yeah. know, yeah. when I'm, it's interesting because when I'm, I don't even know the answer to that question for me when it comes to prose in a way. In poetry, I'm so familiar with just like that like yeah. moment. Like a phrase will just pop mm -hmm. into my head mm -hmm. and I'll be like, oh, I have to write this down. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it's gonna go, but I have to write this mm -hmm. down. It, you know, like my students, if they're out there, know like I talk about that moment, but when you're right, when you're about to fall asleep, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Always. And it just starts coming. You gotta write and it. And you're like, oh, <laughs> like, like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know the phone light's gonna wake me up. <laughs> I've woken up at times and grabbed my phone yeah. and typed something and texted to myself. Yeah. Um, Cause I couldn't, I'm so sleepy, I can't even find the notes app, but just yeah. the text to myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it does come that way. But for me, the shift again was, you know, pre-pandemic, pre this book, I would get that spark and write it down and then maybe come back like a year later, <laughs> like yeah. I thought I had all this time. Now everything happens much faster. And so I don't just jot it down. I just keep writing and I just think of it as if I just keep going, eventually I'm gonna discover something. I you might it down. discover that, you know, I need to be writing something else. That could be the discovery. Um, but sometimes I just, you know, we'll, we'll figure out, but I have to write to get there. And I, you know, I'm not leaving anything and then thinking I'll come back to it later. I've been trying to, you know, finish things, you know, finish one thing and then go on to the next. So that's been different, but those sparks still, you know, come on occasion, but a lot of it is around sleeping and waking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody else, but it's, yeah. you know, dreaming in the pandemic you know, when you don't have the, oh my God, I don't have on a mask dream, <laughs> sometimes there's something else and that something else, I'll wake up with that and I'll, you know, jot that down and that could lead to something. This is not a question from the interview, but um, I'm just gonna turn for a minute to, um, uh, I'm curious if you, is there a way that you could put language to how your work is um, attending to this thing we call blackness or black. How, how is it black? Is it doing, are you, do, you, do you think of your work as doing a kind of race work in, in some level or, I mean, I guess this also has to do a little bit with the kind of question of audience. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You know, I had somebody ask me about that because uh, my book came out in September of 2020, and you know the New York Times bestseller list was filled with books about race. Yeah. And they said, you know, why don't we see more um, fiction? Why is it all nonfiction books that basically are teaching white people or you know presuming a white audience? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I think you kind of answered your own question, you know, which is when people think about books about race, the, in so many books in general, you know, the the presumed audience, the normative audience is, is white. Mm -hmm. And um, in my work, I just, I always just imagine black women as my audience. 
Um, and I, my, one of my greatest fears in, trying to, in thinking about when this book was gonna be looking for a home and a publisher, I was like, please don't have anybody, I don't want an editor who's gonna try and get me to explain things to white people or to imagine a white audience. Um, that was my greatest fear, and I decided that if, so, if that happened, because I, I said, I'm not gonna spend my advance, not that it was big anyway, I was like, because I might have to give it back, because I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think about it as I'm writing the stories, but certainly when you have to start thinking about things like publication and, mm -hmm. and all of that and the editorial process, um, that, you know, I, I kind of come in it in a defensive way, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I believe what Toni Morrison said and what um, August Wilson said, which is we can write specific stories about black life and it still be universal. Yeah. 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 And so, um, I don't even know if that answered your question, yeah. but that's what came yeah, to yeah, mind. Yeah, absolutely. I get asked often like who I imagine my audience is, and for the YA, I, my, my favorite answer to say is that I like thinking of my young adult novels almost as like banquets, mm -hmm. and the people who are getting honored to me are very clear, and it's like black girls, right, and like Caribbean girls, and that's who's coming on stage and receiving the award, but like, you can come and clap and dance and listen, but yeah. like you're not getting the award and you're not getting on stage, right? And like, <laughs> but that's okay. There are other banquets to attend, right? But like that's what my work is doing. And so I walk in kind of giving myself the permission of like you're honoring who you're honoring, and like mm -hmm. if people want to come, they're they're gonna show up, and if not, like mm. that's okay. Um, I don't often name race in any of my work unless it is a white person. Mm. And so the only time a character is like that is the white boy is when when it, uh, when it is clear to me that that is the the person who is not of mm. the mm. rest of the community of the book. Mm -hmm. I will talk about ethnicity because one of the questions that I'm interested in is kind of like how do we talk about um, race within a country where when we say black we think black American mm -hmm. and how how is there tension there with other diasporic folks mm -hmm. how is there um, conversations that are really hard and that need to be had in terms of what black Americans have done in this country for other black folks to be able to benefit mm -hmm. that that we often uh, kind of shift from right like even within I think black communities and so I'm really curious about this push and pull of what it means to be um, proudly black, but maybe have d different definitions of black, mm -hmm. or like coming from the Dominican Republic, um, not being able to say black, or not calling yourself black, or being shamed to call yourself black for mm -hmm. so long, and then coming to a country where you're raised only learning black American history, and so there's this dissonance yeah. of what black means at home and what I want to perceive, and so those questions often come out in my characters, and they're having to grapple with um, varying ways of, of thinking through that. Mm -hmm. So I'll say that it is, it is central in some ways, but um, I'm, I'm just constantly thinking of ethnicity and nationality, mm -hmm. maybe less than like this larger umbrella. I, I really want to get hyper-specific with yeah. uh, some of these questions. Mm -hmm. It's so funny because that moment in my poem where I'm like, they call us African Americans yeah. to, you know, mm -hmm. to save it, is, is really kind of attending to that. Like this, like yeah. weird, like yeah. notion that like all black people in some ways are African Americans. I mean, these are you know people at, at my university who use this yeah. term like yeah. it, as a, 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 a bro, overarching yeah. umbrella, yeah. Um, and it, do, it feels a little soft. I think I'm going to stop using African Americans. Yeah. <laughs> it, flattens, it flattens, you know, it flattens our experience, and it also reveals you know their ignorance of the fact that we are a diasporic mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And sometimes folks want to use it because it's safer than saying black. It's like a fear of saying black. A fear of saying black. Yeah. And so That's sometimes exactly. it's just yeah. like, no, put the teeth back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, I, what's the time? Are we going to do, oh, I think you know, I'll ask one more question. And then if there are audience questions, we do ask if possible that you use one of the microphones there just so we can make sure that we hear you. Um, I mean, I guess the last question, I have, I have so many good ones, we could go on for a long time. Um, okay. This is a hard one. <laughs> so there's this quote in this interview where she says, where Morrison says, um, it's what you don't write that frequently gives what you do write its power. I just love thinking about that, right? And um, so I'm just curious about kind of what 
you aren't writing, if it's if it's if if you can name that, or what's giving your current writing its power. And I want to say that I'm in my poetry. Just I'll just talk a little bit so you, you can think about your answer. I already thought about mine. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all had a leg up this whole time. <laughs> Like in my in my poetry, it's kind of like I'm always tr not writing or writing in some very oblique way about the worst thing that's ever happened to me mm. when I was a child. Mm. And I feel like now it's like unavoidable in this other project that I'm working on, which is explicitly memoir, or essayistic memoir, or whatever we're calling it, because you know I'm writing about my life, and if I leave that thing out. It just doesn't seem possible, right? Even though the book is not about that thing. And so I feel like there's this weird tension between, you know, what, you know, certainly what I'm not writing about, haven't yet written about, need to write about, and then how it's like producing this other text up over it, which is constant, like in some ways, like referencing what hasn't yet been said, um, which is weird. Uh, but in some way also weirdly productive, I think so far, we'll see. Um, I think my fear is that I don't want people to get unduly distracted mm -hmm. by the worst thing so mm -hmm. that they can't hear the other things. Mm -hmm. For a time, I wasn't writing about my father um, and that was a very difficult relationship um, we didn't really have a relationship, which is partly why things were difficult. Um, and I think it impacted the stories in my collection in such a way that um, I'll quote um, my friend Damon Young, uh, who we were, he was interviewing me about the book, and he said, men are garnish in this book. He said, they're on the table, but they're not the meal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that was, you know, that represented the fact that that's what I've been doing around my father my whole writing life, which is I don't want to write about him and all of that. I tried, you know, 15 years ago, and it was basically a very long diary entry in a panel this morning. I called it like a deposition and an indictment. It was not, there was no artistic value to it. Mm. And then I didn't mm. write about him again for like for 15 years, but even that was flash fiction. Six, less than 600 words, I was done. I don't want to write about him anymore. Um, so then, so, you know, men don't show up a lot in, in this book, or they, you know, there, there's a father and he's dead, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but then, again, it's like, the, you know, everything shifted after the book came out. I, could, I was, started writing about my father. Mm -hmm. I wrote a short story that had um, a man as the main character. I'd never done that before. Mm. Yeah. Um, so something, ha I don't know what to call it, but, yeah, something yeah. happens. Yeah. It's funny because when you, you began the question, Dawn, I, I, my first direction went to think about um, Kiese Leiman. I always say his last name super French, so if that's wrong, Key, my bad. Um, <laughs> he, he says, you know, you very rarely need the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. And so when thinking about what you don't write, that I'm someone who's very spare, and I often get really in my head about the fact that my prose is spare, but, but it's often that... Um, I just want to get to the thing. Mm -hmm. I want to give you enough of a narrative setup, and then like let's just talk about the 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 energy that pro like propelled me into telling this story, yeah. right? And so I don't find that I need that second paragraph or whatever the the the, mm -hmm. the entryway, mm -hmm. right? So on, on the level of craft, that's when I'm thinking about like how we how speed how pacing can work. Um, in order to get to the powerful things that we need, mm -hmm. right? Um, or maybe I just tell myself that because I am a very speedy and very short <laughs> writer, right? Like my joints are 60,000 words, that's it, that's the whole book. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, that's comforting. But um, similar to you, Dish, I mean, my books very rarely have present fathers. Mm. They, or, or rather, my books always have present absent fathers. Mm. Fathers who are technically there. Right, my first novel, he is there, but he is not partaking in caregiving of his children. Mm -hmm. My second novel, he exists in his daughter's life through phone calls, but he lives in Puerto Rico. My mm -hmm. third novel, he is dead from the first page, mm -hmm. but his echo is what mm -hmm. is the, the thing that carries the story. And so mm -hmm. I think what, what that does is then put this um, focus on mothers, 
mm. right? Mm. This father is is um, only a ghost in all of these books, and so then that pressure of yeah. how harsh the mothers get um, revealed in my books, but also mm. then my having to look for tenderness, mm. and that is really hard for me, right? Because I cannot find, I, I, it's, it's difficult to find in the direction of the father, so it's easier to just not make them exist, but then I have to grapple with the fact that all of these other caregivers have to be full. And that sometimes that's me looking at, you know, my mother-daughter wound and having to sit mm -hmm. with, like, I can't just rip you down. I have to also think about the fact that you were attempting to do this thing, mm. you know, yes. mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it by yourself. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's speaking to the what you remove and then what's... Yeah, absolutely. What you get. Mm -hmm. um, so th is there a, a last question that the, someone from the audience would like to ask? You, would you mind going to the microphone there? First, first, hi, I'm Nicole. Um, hi. First of all, just a reflection, I teach middle school. Um, so um, thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for your book. Uh, my students love it, my girls love it. Um, I'm, my mother was from Panama, and uh, I did not have any books like this growing up. I had no text to, to find myself in. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, in who your influences were. And when you were reading, TJ, I was, I was thinking about um, Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, mm -hmm. um, that piece where you were talking about, um, I didn't raise you like this, you know, why are you not dressed this? And I think of that tension, right, between a mother uh, wanting their children to, their daughters to be able to function in the society in the way that you know, in this colonized society that um, I think, you know, we, we can go through, you know, uh, and mothers that love that's kind of in conflict and tension. Mm -hmm. I think that also is true in um, the writing itself, right? So, you know, trying to break away from the patriarchy and that writing and, and trying to find your voice, um, kind of like what Elizabeth was saying um, in terms of writing uh, in verse. So I just wondered what your who your influences were and how you kind of grapple with that tension itself. And mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely, um, Jamaica Kincaid's Girl was um, the first writing class I ever took at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts it was a flash fiction course and that was one of the first things we read. And you know, I had read um, literature by and about black people before, obviously, but it was just something about um, the brevity of it, first of all, that I was struck by, because I was not familiar with flash fiction. I was familiar with the short stories that we had to read in, you know, in, in, in high school, which were not always the best. Um, but the voice and the judgment, and if I'm not, if, if I'm remembering correctly, it's just one long block of text, and it's just, and I could hear my grandmother in, in that. So um, that really did have a, a big influence on me, but also, um, Tony K. Bambara's work, um, and just in terms of the the freedom and the irreverence, um, and people, you know, are shocked sometimes when you say that your favorite Toni Morrison book is Sula and not Beloved, but it is. It's Sula, um, mm -hmm. and just you know the, the 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 generation, you know, the multiple generations there, and the women, and what how they each. Um, would define freedom differently um, and how they love differently, um, platonically and romantically. So those were some influences for me. Yeah. I, I'll just say one sentence, which is that the great experimental poet Myung Mi Kim taught me everything I needed to know about the ends of language. Mm. <laughs> you have the last word, Liz. Um. I'm lucky enough to draw from a lot of different traditions. And so um, Sandra Cisneros, of course, I remember being in eighth grade and that was the first book I'd ever read in a classroom setting where everyone was reading the same book and it had Spanish. And even though she was Chicana and she was from Chicago, just this immense feeling of um, this feels like poems, but it's also a story. And then I learned like, you know, Sandra got her MFA in poetry and like found her way into fiction. And so in many ways, there was a blueprint there, but Julia Alvarez was a huge um, writer for me. I'll say that, um, you know, Juno Diaz's Oscar Wilde was one of the first books where I felt like 
the many different languages I had access to were all held in one story. Um, and I think it, it for, for many of us Dominican Americans who um, grew up reading English, there was something there that, that was in recognition. And then, you know, in terms of poets, like Lucille Clifton is, um, I believe, the godmother of all of my poems. Like, I believe that she exists in this other plane, and every time I write a poem, she's just sitting there like, all right, let's go on. Um, and I've heard she was an amazing mother figure, and so I choose to believe she is also my literary spirit guide, um, and you can't tell me otherwise. Uh, but I have, I have my canon, right? And I, I tell all writers, like, you should have your personal literary canon. You should have the legacy of writers whose names you say, who you can trace back to here is where my like writing converges and here are the confluences of how my voice comes forward and I um, mean I can trace the DNA right like I, I have my list and I won't give it to you all because it's a very long but even at the level of romance novels I adore reading romance novels I think that anything I know about structure comes from the tightness uh, required in a romance novel I think because as as a poet you are so familiar with form and that is such a hyper-specific form that has to end in a particular way. You know, that I look at Courtney Milan, I look at uh, Alyssa Cole, like there's just so many writers um, who produce at a level of, I have this thing, you know how it's going to end and I'm still going to create magic, that that's, you know, amazing to me. So I, I draw from those traditions and then spoken word, bolero, like I can keep going, but I, I, mm -hmm. I write in so many genres and so I must pull from all these genres in order to arrive at my voice. Thank you so much. Uh, one more round of applause for us. <laughs> Thank you.